Yeah, that's the thing. Well, and you lose that sense of that dynamic, live dynamic, but you also, it's so much easier on the sound in the room because you don't have all these monitors bouncing sound off in weird ways and feedback. And yeah, exactly right.
Good morning. Welcome to Circleville Christian Church. Would you please stand and worship with us? I try to make it on my own. Every time I try to stand and start to fall. And all those lonely roads I've traveled on. There was Jesus When this life I built came crashing to the ground When the friends I had were nowhere to be found I couldn't see it then, but I can see it now There was Jesus In the waiting in the healing and the hurt, like a blessing buried in the broken pieces. Every minute, every moment, where I've been and where I'm going, even when I didn't know it or couldn't see it, there was Jesus. For this man who needs amazing kind of for forgiveness at a price I couldn't pay. I'm not perfect, so I thank God every day. There was Jesus. There was Jesus. In the waiting, in the searching, in the healing and the hurt. Like a blessing buried in the broken pieces. Every minute. Every moment where I've been and where I'm going, even when I didn't know it or could see it, there was Jesus on the mountain in the valley. There was Jesus in the shadows of the alley. There was Jesus in the fire in the blood. In the healing and the hurting, like a blessing buried in the broken pieces. Every minute, every moment, where I've been and where I'm going, even when I didn't know it, I could see it. There was Jesus. There was Jesus. There. become his righteousness he humbled himself and carried the cross love so amazing love so amazing jesus messiah name above all Body. 
only the blood is bread the wine broken and poured out all for love and the whole earth trembled and the veil was torn love so amazing love so amazing jesus messiah came above all names blessed be Messiah, you're the Lord of all. All our hope is in you. All our hope is in you. All the glory to you, God, the light of the world. Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel. Hold his body down. There ain't no grave. 
Please be seated. How many of you over the past uh, maybe couple of weeks or maybe the past few days have spent, you felt the spirit of Christmas? Felt the spirit of Christmas, anybody? You bet. You bet. You know, the spirit of Christmas, the unconditional love that God has for us, that He sent Jesus to us. But over the next couple of moments, I'd like to take you back to 1914. Start of World War I. And it was a nasty war. You know, when the, when the war started, they, the, uh, the countries at war were using the old strategies of war. You know, and then they were combining that with the new technology of 1914. The old strategies was nothing more than trench warfare. You know, both sides were digging in, and these trenches sometimes were miles long, and sometimes the trenches that were built were only a few hundred yards apart, and sometimes they were a half mile apart or even further. And then the land in between the two trenches, my trench and the enemy trench, was called no man's land. And no man's land was, obviously, it was properly named. Because if you came up out of your trench and you walked into no man's land, there was no way you were going to make it to the other side. Because the enemy was going to shoot you and you were going, that's going to be the, where you're going to spend eternity right there in terms of physical body. It was a mess. And then you combine the technology of 1914, the automobile the tank, poisonous gas, a machine gun that could shoot 600 bullets a minute. And then later in the war, the airplane was used as a weapon of war. But it was, it, World War I was a nasty war. And then God decided to use his power and his authority to throw out the Christmas spirit upon those combatants of war. And the German soldiers felt it first. And they started singing Christmas carols December 25, 1914. They were singing Christmas carols, and they decided to put their weapons down. So they left their guns inside the trench. They crawled up out of the trench, walking across no man's land. And the British on the other side and the French heard the singing. They heard the Christmas carols being sung. They peeked up over the top of the trench, and they saw that the Germans were in no man's land, but they didn't have any weapons. So they, too, left their weapons in the trench. They started to sing Christmas carols, and up out of the trench they came, and they greeted their enemy in no man's land. They were out there shaking hands. They were trading things like cigarettes and chocolate and plum pudding. And matter of fact, it was even written that that a friendly game of soccer was played between the two sides in no man's land. And then after a few hours, they shook hands, they walked back to their respective trenches, but they did agree to continue the ceasefire for the rest of Christmas Day. Only God could stop World War I for a few hours to allow those combatants of war to celebrate the birth of our Savior. But you know the rest of the story. For God so loved the world that he gave. God gave. God gave us a baby. And he was born to, in a manger to the Virgin Mary. And we know the rest of the story, don't we? That baby grew into a boy. That boy grew into a man. And that man became our Savior. In John 3.17, it says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. For whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. What a tremendous promise God has made to us. 
And you know, the Christmas spirit that we've felt over the last couple of days, it should be something that we should feel as Christians every day of our life. And as we come to the table of communion every Sunday, the Christmas spirit should overwhelm us as we come to the table. For Jesus said, this do in remembrance of me. And as we take that little piece of bread where it represents the body of Jesus, that body was beaten. That body was nailed to a cross for us. And as we take that, we take the juice. That juice represents the blood of Christ that was shed on that cross for the forgiveness of our sins. Yes, Jesus took the sins of the world to the cross. The spirit of Christmas should be felt every day. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, for this day. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, for the love that you show to us each and every day of our lives. And I just pray, Heavenly Father, this morning for all the blessings that you have given us. And we're so thankful for those. And during this past year, it's been a rough year. The pandemic has hit. Many people have lost jobs. We've, we've experienced a really rough year. But I just pray, Heavenly Father, that as we roll into the next year, that we will continue to be faithful to you. That our church family here will continue to be faithful to you. And I pray, Heavenly Father, as we look at the prayer concern list in our, in our handout, we have many people that have been stricken with COVID-19. And I just pray, Lord, you'll put your healing hand upon each and every one of them. We have people on our prayer list, Lord, that, that have been in surgery and that are recovering from surgery. I just pray, Lord, you'll put your, your hand of healing upon them so the recovery will be quick. And, Lord, there are people in our congregation, there are people in our community that need your compassion. And I just pray you'll put your hand of compassion upon them. That only you can provide that type of compassion and love each and every day. I just pray, Heavenly Father, now as we come to our table of communion, that we will always be mindful of the love that God has for us and the willingness that Jesus had in going to that cross for us. We're so very thankful, Lord. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. I see shadows, you see hope. I see broken, but you see beautiful, and you're helping me to believe. You're restoring me piece by piece. There's nothing too dirty that you can't make worthy. You wash me in mercy. too dirty that you can't make worthy you wash me in mercy I am clean what was dead now lives again my heart's beating beating inside my chest joy and destiny oh, cause you're restoring me piece by piece there's nothing too dirty that you can't make worthy you wash me in mercy I am clean there's nothing too dirty that you can't make worthy 
Wash me in mercy. I am clean. Washed in the blood of my sacrifice. Your blood flowed red and made me white. My dirty rags are purified. I am clean. Washed in the blood of your sacrifice. Your blood flowed red and made me white. My dirty rags are purified. I am clean, I am clean, oh, washed in the blood of your sacrifice. Your blood flowed red and made me white. My dirty rags are purified. I am clean, I am clean, I am clean. Oh, you made me, you washed me. Green light usually means good to go. Good morning. <laughs> Man, thanks so much for that, Lyle. Uh, reminds me of Romans 8, 1 and uh, the promise we have in Christ. Therefore, there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Uh, I take that for granted a lot, and uh, I'm thankful for that reminder. Uh, my name is Spencer Askren. Uh, if you know Dale and Isla Rose, uh, then you know my grandparents. And uh, uh, this is my wife, Jessie Lynn. If you haven't got a chance to meet her, she's my better half. She's the better looking half. Um, she, uh, she, she's, she's awesome. Uh, I work for a campus ministry called Student Mobilization. Rather, I should say we work for a campus ministry called Student Mobilization. And seven years ago, uh, Circleville Christian Church sent me out uh, to Central Arkansas. And uh, I've been reflecting on, it's crazy that was seven years ago, but I've been reflecting on those seven years, and uh, there's one thing that sticks out, and I think in, in this year, in this time, and everything that everybody's been through throughout this year, uh, this remains true, is, is I've just, I just see God's faithfulness. And so when I got to Central Arkansas, I had no idea what I was supposed to be doing, but I look back on those four years that I got to spend there, and uh, I see God's faithfulness. I think of guys like Ethan and Rich and John and Alex and Tucker and Grayson, um, men that came into college not following Christ, uh, got to lead them to Christ, got to grow them and disciple them through the next three years of college, and to see where those guys are at today, most of them are married, uh, walking with the Lord, trying to have an impact. And I was actually talking to one of those guys, Ethan, just a few days ago, and he told me he and his, his new wife are, are, are praying about going overseas and being missionaries for long term. And uh, that's part of what you guys have been praying for. That's part of what you guys have been supporting and funding. And so I'm really, really thankful for that. But again, in all of that, I see God's faithfulness. Well, you fast forward to 2021, and, and, uh, or 2020, excuse me, I'm looking forward, 2021. <laughs> you fast forward to 2020, and uh, we're in our third year of, of, of launching a campus ministry up at the University of Wyoming, and uh, man, what a year. And I was trying to think, hey, what can I share with you guys that would give you a good idea of what's been going on there, and I think of my friend Jordan. Uh, Jordan is a junior this year at the University of Wyoming. I met him there uh, a year and a half ago and uh, built a relationship with Jordan. Jordan and I met in the weight room, and I'm turning 30 this year, so it's a struggle to keep up with some of these guys in the weight room these days, but I'm doing my best. And uh, I tell Jess almost every day, hey, I'm still in my prime, you know, I've still got it. And uh, that's probably not true anymore. <laughs> And so I meet Jordan in the weight room about a year and a half ago. We develop a relationship, and I get to share the gospel with, with Jordan. Jordan grew up in Cheyenne, Wyoming, right down the road, and kind of had the typical Cheyenne background of, hey, grew up uh, not going to church, um, grew up in uh, playing every sport possible, um, and, then, and then came over to do his undergrad at the University of Wyoming. And so Jordan had no background, and he made a pretty quickly apparent that he just wasn't interested. Now, hey, that's fine. Uh, hey, if you ever are, I, I hope you'll reach out. So coming into this fall, I hadn't heard from Jordan in a year and a half, um, hadn't heard anything, and I get a text about a month before the school year, and it said, uh, hey, Spence, sorry I haven't been around. I'm ready to grow in my faith. Like literally haven't talked to the guy in, in a year and a half. 
And so I'm like, hey, man, that's awesome. Hey, I'd love to hear what changed, like what sparked that. Um, and he goes, yeah, I'd love to tell you, hey, when we get back to school, let's meet up. And I'm like, well, hey, if you're wanting to grow, you don't have to wait for me to start growing. Why don't you read the book of John um, and, and write down questions you have, and let's just talk about it when you get back. And so Jordan and his family took a trip to, um, to Yellowstone, and on the ride back from Yellowstone, he read the entire book of John and wrote down questions he has. And so Jordan showed up the first day of school. We got to sit down together, and we just talked through his questions, uh, questions about different parables. Hey, what is a parable? Um, it says this several times. I don't know what this word means. Um, hey, I heard the word gospel in here. What, what, does, what does this mean? We got to talk through, hey, it means good news. I mean, it's this good news of the story of Jesus. And, and uh, he go, okay, so what does really, when he died on the cross, what does that really represent? And we got to talk through that. And uh, fast forward about two months after that, Jordan and I are sitting down again, and for the last two months, we've been reading through the Bible uh, more. I've been sharing illustrations with him, telling him my story and how Christ changed my life in college. And, uh, um, I, and I've constantly been giving Jordan's, uh, Jordan opportunities to respond. Like, hey, man, where are you at with this decision? And, and so it's another one of those days. Hey, Jordan, we're sitting in Subway, just ate our footlongs. And uh, hey, Jordan, you know, we've been talking about this. Where are you at with this decision? And he goes, oh, yeah, I made that last week. I'm like, well, wait, you didn't tell me? Like, we've been processing this for like three months now. And, and, uh, but Jordan, the week before that, um, had just gotten alone and gotten with God and was like, hey, I, I want to make this decision. I believe Jesus came, that he lived the life I can't, and that I, I need a Savior. And I think that's what we've seen, Jess and I and the team at Wyoming this year, is, is just through this whole season of, of COVID, of a pandemic, is it's really pushed people outside of their norm and forced them to really think about, okay, what do I believe? And where is, um, what eternal thoughts do I have? What do I have an assurance of salvation? Do I know what's next? Do I even know what I believe? And I think on the college campus, that's a question we encounter a lot is, hey, what, you know, what, what do I believe? You know, where do I think I'm going? What do I think is next? Um, a huge highlight for Jess this year has been she's been an assistant coach on the cheer team. And uh, throughout the entirety of, of this fall semester, she got um, half of the cheer team, so anywhere from 15 to 17 girls involved in a weekly faith discussion. And so, again, these are girls from all across the United States, from, from Vegas to Florida and everywhere in between, that every week she got to sit down with and, and, and read, a, read something out of the Bible and talk about and share the gospel with them um, and help them take steps closer to that. That's been a huge, huge highlight for her. She's also had some early mornings, some, some 7 a.m. practices, and so I've been thankful that I'm not a, a cheer coach this year. <laughs> it's been great. Um, I was telling, talking to Sally in the, in the back, and, and another huge highlight for us uh, this year is we got to about August, the first week of, sorry, the first week of October, and really we had a decision to make of, hey, are we going to continue to really feel hamstringed and really not be able to reach out to our full potential like we feel like we're able to? Um, or are we going to take a step of faith and go, hey, God, we're going to put this in your hands because we feel like we've been commissioned and we've been called to be obedient in this area to gather and to help students keep taking steps forward. And so we went for it. And so every Wednesday uh, night, 7 a.m. to about 9 or 10, sorry, 7 p.m. to about 9 or 10 p.m. Every Wednesday night, we just had students over for dinner. We'd hang out for a little while, uh, and then I'd, I'd give a little 20-minute talk and just talk about faith in college. And every time in there, share the gospel and, and what Jesus did has done for us. And throughout, the, from really from October 1st through Thanksgiving, we had a weekly meeting in our house of about anywhere from 15 to 35 students. And that was a huge highlight. Um, Got to see a lot of students take steps, but really what we've started to see is just a community form of either young believers or people who aren't following Christ but just really interested in growing for the first time. And there's a lot of power. I think we've seen that this year, uh, and you guys are experiencing that this morning. There's a lot of power in being able to gather. Uh, there's a lot of evangelism that goes on in just meeting together. And when the outside community sees that, uh, it's really, really attractive. Um, and so I think those have definitely been some highlights for us. Since January through now, we've seen, uh, we're really certain about six students, three guys and three girls that have placed their trust in Christ, Jordan being one of them. Um, and we're really, really excited about that. We're taking 13 students with us to our winter conference down in Dallas um, a week from tomorrow, and uh, we couldn't be more excited about that. And so uh, overall, in all of that, church, I really hope you hear... Um, 
God's faithful. You know, I know we've all experienced some really, really hard things this year. Um, but I, I think even through the hard things, I've seen more and more of God's faithfulness probably than I've just been aware of, I think, even in, in the past. And so uh, I hope you know Jess and I are extremely thankful for each of you, uh, this church, and a lot of individuals in here partner with us uh, through prayer and through financial giving. And so we wouldn't be able to do what we're doing without you guys. And so I wanted to take a second and just say thank you and uh, share a little bit of your return on investment in us. And um, we're going to keep moving forward. So thanks so much. We're thankful for you. Good morning to all of you. It's, uh, it's nice to be back. I'm the guy who shows up every once in a while. My name is Dave, and uh, a lot of you don't know me personally. You know my face, and uh, I think this is maybe the fifth or sixth time that I've been here over the last few years, but it's good to be back, and uh, it's good to see all of you. And I want to start off with student mobilization uh, to say a lot of where I'm really starting this message today is something hopefully that resonates with all of you. Um, my primary thing that I get to do is I work with college students and, uh, and uh, I get to teach and questions that have come my way uh, through the years from college students are amazing. Um, some really profound questions but also some really personal questions in the sense of the way people process faith in terms of their own life and their own experience. And uh, questions are a huge part of this journey of um, discovery in life. They're a huge part of coming to understand not only what we believe, but why we believe what we believe. Because for a lot of people, um, simply having a belief that is unfounded is not adequate. And, and I can sympathize with that. I understand that. I, I, I appreciate the reality when someone says to me, I really need to understand this to, to buy in, to, to live this, and to, be, and to be part of this. So let me start off with some odd questions for you today. Um, I'm one of these people that I, I, I operate um, with questions running in the background all the time. Um, and this is either going to resonate with you or you're going to just understand how odd I honestly am. Because at this point, you're like, oh yeah, you know, he gets up and he talks and he seems normal, right? Um, so let me ask you some questions here. And uh, these are ones that I have come across, um, oh, in the last few months. Uh, my brain is always pondering questions, and uh, I'm one of these guys that I can kind of sit back and uh, just observe. And I, I love talking, I like uh, visiting with people, I, I love being social, I love teaching, but if you put me in a room of 100 people, if I'm not like the one that's supposed to get up and talk, I'm probably the guy who's going to kind of sit back and watch. And, uh, and part of that in my brain, are, the questions are always running, and I'm, I'm observing, and I'm, I'm thinking through everything. So I ran across these questions recently, and uh, some of them are decent. Um, some of them are just odd, okay? So I'm not asking for replies unless you are really motivated, okay? And then you can yell back any reply you want, all right? So in one sentence, how would you describe the internet? Think about what that thing is, Right? Um, the, the myriad of things that it is. And you go, okay, so for a guy like me, I easily remember a time not all that long ago when the internet just wasn't a known thing. It wasn't a thing. And yet my kids, who are 23 and 19, have never known a world without it. Okay, so it's this huge thing, and you go, well, well what is it, really? All right, so um, here's another question for you. Um, what is the weirdest smell that you've ever smelled? And that could be a wonderful memory or not so much, right? Or, or how about this one? Uh, what is the best kind of cheese? There's a few of you thinking about this, right? Okay, you have some opinions? Yeah, of course you do, right? Um, here, we're getting a little, a little deeper here. Um, what mythical creature would improve the world the most if it actually existed? I asked that question once and somebody yelled out to me, a unicorn. And I'm like, well, that's cool, but how does it make the world better, right? Okay, and here's the last one. And uh, this one I'm going to apologize in advance because this is actually going to affect the way you look at something, okay? And uh, I don't think it's going to hurt the way you look at something, but it will change the way you look at something. All right, you ready? Is cereal actually breakfast soup? <laughs> Think of what qualifies for soup, 
right? And I'm a serial lover. I mean, that's like three or four days a week. That's, that's the thing for me. And it has changed the way I look at it. So um, the reason why I ask you questions as I started was questions are an important part of our journey. And I think one of the reasons why we don't ask questions is we feel like they can be too revealing. They can let people in a little bit too much sometimes. Um, when we ask questions, for, the, for some people, it's an adventure. You have a personality type where a question pops in your head and it instantly finds its way to words. You have the question, boom, and you're asking the question. There are others in the room who would never vocalize a question unless their life depended on it, and that's questionable, whether they would even voice it then. Right? So questions are one of those things that have risk to them. Because questions reveal something about the questioner. Questions reveal something about where we are in life, how we see things. They reveal the way we approach things. Because questions are built on something. They're not neutral. They're, uh, they're attempting to discover something unknown or to seek clarity. And so questions are risky things, but questions can also be wonderful things. And so oftentimes people don't ask questions out of fear of how people will perceive them for simply having the questions. So what we find in Scripture then, especially in the Gospels, is this. We find all kinds of people who have questions about who Jesus is. And they're good questions. We find different kinds of people who have questions. Some are people that end up being Jesus' opponents or His enemies. And so they have questions about Jesus that lead to further questions, which lead them to conclusions about Jesus that are negative conclusions. For, for whatever reason they have those, we see that. We see questions from the opponents. We see questions from people in general. And oftentimes, these are just discovery questions. A guy walks up to Jesus and says, what's the most important commandment? It was a real question. It was a question that was meant to elicit a response because the guy wanted to know, what is Jesus' perspective on this? We see questions from Jesus' disciples. And all the way through the Gospels, you would think these guys get it, right? But then you hear the questions and you go, you know, I would have those questions too. I appreciate the questions that they're asking because they are seeing a man in their life that defies their expectations. And so they have questions. There's one, though, who struggles with Jesus' identity, and he asks a question, and it's wonderfully surprising. It's Matthew uh, chapter 11. I'm going to read this passage of Scripture for you. Matthew chapter 11, starting in verse 2. And this individual is John the Baptist. Okay, so there's a couple of Johns in Jesus' life. There's a John who's a disciple, and then there's another John that we call John the Baptist, who is, think of him more honestly like a peer. He is a prophet who comes to make the way for Jesus, right? He, this is a significant figure, a significant person of faith in Scripture. So we get to Matthew chapter 11, and we see this in verse 2, and it says this, Now when John heard in prison, John's in prison, about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples, and he said to him, are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? What a shocking question. It's a shocking question because of the guy who was asking it. It's a shocking question because this guy, let's, let's do a little background here. This guy is Jesus' cousin. John the Baptist's mother and Jesus' mother were pregnant at the same time, and there are these wonderful accounts of that in Scripture. This guy is the one who grew up knowing who Jesus was and, and hearing about the proclamations made at Jesus' birth. This guy is the one who was out at the Jordan River baptizing people for repentance of sins. Jesus comes out to him, and John's response to Jesus was, um, I shouldn't be baptizing you, you should baptize me. And Jesus looks at him and says, no, John, you baptize me, this is the right thing. This is the guy who, at Jesus' baptism, when he goes down in the water and brings him back up, it says that the heavens were split open, the Spirit descended like a dove, and a voice came from heaven that said, this is my beloved Son, with Him I'm well pleased. And then he asked this question of Jesus, are you the one to come or shall we look for another? Do you hear the depth of that question? 
Out of all people who have walked the face of the earth, this is the guy who should understand Jesus' identity better than anyone else. And so when I hear this question, then I think, why is John asking this question? Because John's a smart guy. John is a man of faith. Jesus in this passage that I'm going to finish reading here in a moment says that John is the greatest human being ever born to a woman. Okay, so I get that all in my head and then I hear the question and I go, John has this question then about Jesus That's a good question. Let's read the rest of the passage here. Jesus answered them, go and tell John what you you see. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have good news preached to them. Blessed is the one who is not offended by me. When they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did he go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing. He's talking about John. John's not a soft guy, right? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet, this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. It's speaking of John, right? Truly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has, ne- there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist, yet the one who is the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So John asked this question, and I want us to hear the question, and I want us to really think about this question, because if John is asking this question, we all should be. If John is asking this question, this gives us permission to go, who then is Jesus really? Here's John's question. Are you the one who is to come? Or shall we look for another? Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about John for just a few moments here. When John asked this question, um, the passage we read tells us that John is in prison. And John was in prison because he opposed Herod the king. And he is um, said of Herod that Herod had taken Herod's own brother's wife for his wife while his brother was still alive. Okay, so John calls him out for this and and condemns him for this. Herod's new wife doesn't like that, gets John arrested. He stays in prison for quite some time. Scripture tells us that Herod keeps bringing John in to talk to him because Herod is so impressed by John, but he's conflicted because John is condemning him, but he's impressed by him. And so we have this weird thing going on here And not too long after John asked this question in Matthew 11, he dies. Not too long. At the hands of Herod. This then needs to be viewed as a question of a man who's coming to an ending point in his life. And he may know that. He probably knows that. And he's asking this question because his whole life has been built around who is God going to send? Because he knew God was sending someone. He understood his role and he knew that God was sending someone. And his whole life has been built around this idea, is Jesus the one? He's proclaimed Jesus as the one. He's believed Jesus as the one. But here's the problem. Jesus does not look like nor act like what John thinks Jesus should look and act like. And John's not the only one. Most people felt that way about Jesus. So John says this, are you really it? Or should we look for someone else. I love this question because it allows us then as people, whether we are believers or not, to process this idea about who John is. So here I want to read for you just a few verses to show you John's expectation about who Jesus ought to be. Ready? So this is found in Matthew chapter 3, and this is right before Jesus' baptism that I talked to you about. John baptized him right before John baptizes Uh, Jesus, he has an encounter with a group of religious leaders. And John is out in the wilderness, out by the river, um, baptizing people. And this baptism was a a normal Jewish practice of turning away from sin, of repenting. So people are coming out to him. And not long before Jesus comes out to him, a group of religious leaders comes out to him. And listen to John's response to these leaders. Uh, Matthew chapter 3, verse 7. When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? 
bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But the chaff he will burn up with unquenchable fire. That passage probably gives us the best insight into understanding what John expected Jesus to be. He expected a Savior that would come in the world and make things right by overturning that which was wrong. He expected a Messiah who would come in and not only confront the religious leaders, but remove the religious leaders and put in people who were holy and just. He expected a Messiah who would change the culture so much in that moment that the kingdom of God would be seen in its fullness, God's rule and God's reign in the world, in its fullness, right then, right there. That was John's expectation of what the Messiah ought to be. And so Jesus doesn't fit the expectation. John expects fire and brimstone. Jesus is healing people and feeding people. And sometimes having confrontational conversations, oftentimes, but he's not striking them dead. He's actually bringing people to life. This expectation that John had for Jesus is an expectation that was founded on some scripture and was reasonable to think about, but that is not the way God acted. It is not the way he chose to come into this world. And so John was disillusioned by what Jesus was doing, but especially by what he was not doing. So here's John, and you and I have been there. You and I have been in the same place where we go, maybe I was wrong. I thought I knew that. Maybe I'm off. Maybe I misunderstood something. And, And we get that question. And God, in this beautiful way, lets us hear the question. And it's a beautiful question. Are you the one to come? Or shall we wait for another? We might find ourselves asking that question, are you the one? And I want you to understand more than anything else that that is an all right question. It does not betray your confidence in God. It does not say anything negative about you. It is a good question to ask. Because if we can answer that question and say, yes, Jesus is the one to come. Yes, Jesus is the one that God sent. Yes, Jesus is the one who came to make the world right and to set us right with God and right with people. Then that changes everything. So it's good to answer that question. John was right to ask it. John was simply disillusioned by who Jesus was. But it doesn't say anything about Jesus. It says things about John's imagination, about what Jesus ought to be. And at one time or another, most Christians are disillusioned by a God who doesn't live up to our expectations. I could name for you moments in my faith where that's happened. And I could oftentimes describe for you the kind of growth that God brought about in my life when I came to terms with my expectations of God. We see this in this passage of Scripture. John was disillusioned when he asked the question, but disillusionment can be a gift because here's the deal. Disillusionment means that our illusions get destroyed. The illusion goes away. Expectations that are ill-founded have a chance to go away because God does not always conform to our expectations Our requirements for God reveal far more about us than they do about God. And that's what we're seeing in this passage of Scripture as John is coming to terms with this. And when illusions are wiped away, we're honestly free to see God for who God really is. Let me give you an example of a good kind of disillusionment. God sends the Messiah into the world to change the world, to bring the kingdom of God into the world, and that Messiah is born in a stable and dies on a cross. The bracketing events to Jesus' physical life on earth 
our disillusionment. And that's good because it allows us to see then that God has something different from our expectations, that God has something better than what our expectations actually could imagine. And so John voices his deepest doubts and Jesus answers them. He doesn't rip on John at all, not not in the slightest bit. He simply answers them. Listen to John's answer here in Matthew uh, chapter 11, or Jesus' answer here, Matthew 11, verses 4 and 5. So John asks the question, are you the one to come or shall we look for another? Here's verse 4. And Jesus answered them, go and tell John what you see and hear. The blind received their sight, the lame walked, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have good news preached to them. Blessed is the one who is not offended by me. This is not a, a, a direct quotation of one passage. Here's Jesus' answer. It's a, it's a compilation. It, Jesus is taking all kinds of descriptions about him, found especially in the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament, and in particular Isaiah 35. He's taking kind of that chapter and that book, and he's pressing it all together and go, okay, John, you know what Scripture has to say, so I'm going to compress it all together and say, Do you see these things? Do you you see what Jesus is doing? Do you see what Jesus is about? He says, so tell John, look at the evidence of what Jesus is about. And when you look at the evidence, then you will know. John was dialed into this perspective. It's Isaiah 35 verse 4. And Jesus uses the words around Isaiah 35 verse 4 to answer him. But Isaiah 35 verse 4 uses these words vengeance and recompense of God. (laughs) But all around that, the lame walked, the the poor fed. Jesus is telling John, see the whole picture. Understand the whole picture. See what it is that God is about, what God can actually do. And the language of vengeance in Scripture is real language, but it is language that we see in Scripture about making things right. Is God judgmental? Yes, God is judgmental, and the judgment is intended to bring healing for all of creation. Does God punish? Yes, God punishes, and the punishment is meant to bring about restoration. This is what Jesus is doing for John. He's reshaping John's perspective about what he was about. And words that oftentimes sound like war in Scripture are, in fact, words leading to peace. Jesus came to make peace with and for the world. That's what he was about. And he's helping John to understand the means by which God is doing that. So he says to John, look at all of that stuff, John. You know it. John just needed a reminder. And then there's this last line, blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Okay, that sounds like he might be kind of slamming John a little bit. He's not. He's not at all, actually. Um, Maybe your passage of scripture in your translation says, blessed is the one who does not fall away on account of me. The image that is actually being said there doesn't quite get into our language right. The image is stumble. Blessed is the one who does not stumble over me. You guys have done that. I do that kind of stuff all the time. Where you'll be walking along and you're looking out there and you didn't realize that the sidewalk had a one-inch raise in it and apparently I shuffle, right? And you know, your toe hits it and you... That's the image that Jesus is giving him. John, look at what my life is about. Look what I have done. Da, 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 all of this description. And he goes, and John, blessed are you if you don't trip over what I actually am. It's a really sweet reply. It's a kind reply because he's inviting John to say, just lift your feet a little bit and get over this expectation that you have and see what it is that God is actually about. So, here's the part where we get to do something with it. If Jesus came to bring peace, because that's what he's telling John, what does that look like for us? So, in the last few minutes here, I just want to talk about the way we apply peace in two different ways. The first way that we apply peace is peace with God. Peace with God. 
as Christians, we rightfully talk about this, and we should talk about this, that Jesus came to set us at peace with God. That is, in reality, what Jesus came to do. He dies on a cross not because the cross was God's ultimate plan of what he wanted to do. He dies on a cross to atone for sin. He dies on a cross because of our guilt. He dies on a cross because of our disobedience. That was not the end goal. The end goal was to set us at peace with the Father. And so when we look at this and we see what Jesus says to John, John, realize that what I'm about is about bringing peace with and for the world. We need to talk about peace with God. And we need to say, as Christians, we hold deeply to this, that because of what Jesus did, we can have peace with the Father. We can have peace with God. We can find our sins forgiven, and we can find ourselves in a place of, of wonder, of amazement, that there's a God who loves us that much, that he gives that much to set us at peace with him. So we can talk about peace with God, but we can also do this. We can also talk about peace with people. What we see every day and what we experience every day, then, is brokenness in this world. We experience broken systems, broken relationships, a broken creation. We experience brokenness on all kinds of levels, and, and we just, we've, we're used to it. It's the entirety of our experience. I mean, everything around us at some level is in decay or brokenness. And so when we look at that, then, and we understand what Jesus is saying here, he came to make peace with the world and for the world. So we can talk about being at peace with God, but we can also talk about being at peace with people. And it's so much, um, encompasses so much of what Jesus said to his disciples. So much of what Jesus said in things like the Sermon on the Mount. Setting us at peace in our relationships with other people. Helping to heal the brokenness um, in this world is participating then in God's peace. And so, as Christians then, we're invited to be active participants in peacemaking. Active participants in actually making things right. And so God calls us to be peacemakers. And so here's the question that I want us to just kind of work through as we're ending here today. In what way has God called you to bring peace? In what way has God called you to bring peace to people? God brings peace to you with him. In what way does he invite us then to be peacemakers in this world with people around us? Our world doesn't need another critic. It doesn't need another debater. It needs peacemakers. And sometimes criticism is part of that, and sometimes debating is part of that, but those are not ends in themselves. God calls us to be peacemakers in relationships, to, be, to set things right to confront where we need to confront, to forgive where we need to forgive, to seek forgiveness where we need to seek forgiveness ourselves, and to be peacemakers with those around us. And I think when we do that, then we really understand the heart of Jesus' reply to John. He came to make peace with and for the world, and he invites us to do that with him. Father, our prayer as uh, we wrap up here today is that you help us to understand the reality of John's question, the reality of a real question that was seeking a real answer, that it says nothing negative of, of John. He just becomes a beautiful, beautiful example to us of what it means to pursue you and to pursue knowing you. And so we pray, God, that we can move from that point to this place where we understand our active role in this world that we can bring, be bringers of peace. And so, Father, help us with that. Humble our hearts where we are arrogant. Uh, give us uh, an inclination and a desire to forgive others. Help us, Father, when, when we sin, to make things right with those who we have sinned against. I, I pray, Father, that you help us to see the value of this and to see the beauty of this and understand what Jesus has done in reality is rooted in this idea of setting us at peace with you and calling us then to be peacemakers in the world. And so, Father, let us embrace the call before us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
you would stand if you would like to sing our closing song today. Shame is a prison as cool as a grave. Shame is a robber and he's come to take my name. Love is my redeemer lifting me up from the ground. Love is the power where my freedom song is found. There ain't no grave. I'm gonna hold my body down. There ain't no grave. I'm gonna hold my body down. When I hear that trumpet sound, I'm gonna rise up out of the ground. Cause there ain't no grave. I'm gonna hold my With a smooth and velvet tongue Fear is a tyrant He's always telling me to run Love is resurrection and Love is a trumpet sound Love is my weapon He's gonna take my giants down There ain't no grave Gonna hold my body down There ain't no grave and life there on the tree the lamb of god was crucified he went on down to hell and he took back every key he rose up like a lion and he's setting all the captives free cause there ain't no break i hold my body down there ain't no break Ready?